We're excited. We're very, very happy. We had a paper accepted about 10 days ago, a paper that we've worked on for a couple of years. And the reason we're happy is because we've done a fantastic piece of work. And it's been accepted by Physical Review Letters, which is one of the top journals in the field. Now, you have to appreciate that this took me a while this morning, Brady, so I need you to be impressed. What I've done here is I've just got a bowl of water and floating there on the surface is a paperclip. This is a, a preprint version of it. Emergent surface tension in vibrated, non-cohesive granular matter. Well, it's impressive because you know that a steel paperclip should be denser than water and so it should sink. Uh, but it doesn't sink and the reason it doesn't sink is because it's sitting on the surface tension of the water. Normally it's associated with molecules such as water and two water molecules, suppose these are water molecules, are attracted to each other by long range forces. The water molecules which are this sort of shape, they bond together in little triangles uh, electrostatically so they're so small that the uh, electrostatic bonding between the molecules is quite strong. So what we've done is something completely different. We've taken a box full of grains of bronze. So this, not to scale, is a grain of bronze. Our grains of bronze are 150 microns in diameter. And we put them in a box 20 centimetres square. Let's get to the point. Let me show you the experiment that we actually did. I'm going to have to turn on the amps. That means it's going to get a little bit noisy. Um, and then we're going to shake some sand. Then we put it in the cell and shake it up and down this way at a frequency of 60 hertz. And so these all start jiggling about all over the place. And you would imagine if you're shaking these about by jig jiggling them up and down, they would become randomized. And they do to some. But under some circumstances, all of them want to go to one side and you get a dense phase over here. And there's just a few particles over there. This is our experiment. OK. So we flip it on and we're expecting that it's going to phase separate into a dense and a dilute phase. And there it goes. These two particles, when they're moving together, bash together and come out with a lesser speed. So if they hit each other smack on at 10 metres a second, bam, they come out with a fraction of that speed. Why, why was I always told energy is conserved? Well, energy is conserved, but the kinetic energy of the coming in and going out is reduced because some of this goes into heating up the particles and some of it goes into sound. So there is energy loss in the collision. And about 30% of the velocity is lost in these collisions if they're smack on. If they're gentle ones from the side, it's not so damaging. So what happens is if these come together, you get a little cluster forming and they bash together so many times that they almost come to a standstill. And when they made a little cluster, another one comes in and bashes it and it makes a little cluster. Because of the inelasticity, the, the energy loss in these collisions, there's a, a, a likelihood that they will cluster together and form little clusters. What we're seeing here is that it's not separating instantaneously, but it's undergoing some separation through uh, a pattern which we call spinodal decomposition, which is just a scientific term for the way that these things separate. First of all, we did the experiment. This is a picture after 0.3 seconds, that's a third of a second, after the thing has been turned on. It starts off uniform, but after 0.3 seconds, in this frame, you can see little patches of bronze colour, that's the bronze particles, and the darker bits are where few bronze particles are. And it's starting to want to cluster together into these little heaps and evolved into something which you now look at and say, oh, there's a bridge of a continuous path, I can wander around here. But what's interesting, we've got a really nice one here actually, what's interesting is that we've got this little circular droplet here and the very fact that that's circular tells me that there's a surface tension at play here. But remember what this is, this is just sand shaking up and down in a box. There's no intermolecular forces holding things together, this is just me shaking marbles in a box. But it's acting like it's got a surface tension. How bizarre. Nobody knew that there would be surface tension in this. If you put water in, there's going to be surface tension of the grains because the water will make little bridges and pull them together. But before, when you start off with dry grains of bronze, which are nice and shiny, with no water there, it wasn't obvious at all that they were going to stick together. If I put a big bale of hay in the middle of a field, 
and a hundred cows all came because they wanted to have it and they all kind of gathered around it. I haven't created surface tension within cows, have I? Surely just because there's a big round blob doesn't mean there has to be surface tension. It's ironic that you choose that example because you have. That's exactly what you've done. When you have a system where an animal, for example, comes in, I'm going to say normally, comes in at right angles to all of the other animals, then it might slow down, it'll slow down more than if it comes in tangentially to all of the other animals, because then it can keep going, it's a glancing blow. If you think about billiard balls moving around on a table, if I've got a pack of them, and one comes in and hits the pack square, it's going to stop dead, it loses all of its energy. But if one takes a glancing blow, it just bounces off and it keeps most of its energy. And it's that loss of energy at the interface which is what creates the surface tension. By the very definition, we're stretching the interface just a little bit. We've gone ahead and we've measured this surface tension. I've got a beautiful graph where we can actually see the difference between the forces pulled this way and the forces pulled this way, just like the paperclip. We've got a weight and then we've got some tension, like a trampoline skin, supporting that weight. Well, we can see that in our graph this beautiful circular form, and the dark blue region there is showing you where the surface tension actually is. And we're the first people to have actually measured that in a granular system. Well, the idea that you take something and shake it is pervasive. I mean, you know, I get my bag of muesli every morning, and I open the new packet, and there's always Brazil nuts at the top, or raisins. And you shake it up, and you think it's going to do it and people try and shake it up, or they try and shake it up powders in medicines to try and make it uniform. And it doesn't work because, for some reason, things like to cluster together, and in this case, they seem to cluster together and separate out into different bits. So this is something which is not understood at all in terms of physics. This is one of the big difficult problems of the age, as it were. What happens when you have a system which is not in equilibrium, it's driven from equilibrium, energy is dissipated in some way, and yet it seems to reach a steady state which you can't describe using the normal laws of physics. So in here, this is our uh, economical supercomputer, shall we call it. And what we've got here, as well as a thumping great dual-core CPU,